Welcome to United Body of Christ Church, an online ministry where it is our mission to minister and feed the Word of God to the body of Christ. Visit our website at ubcchurch.org where we offer free full-length video and audio Bible study lessons taught verse by verse. Select a speaker, topic, or series and click filter to view the Bible lesson of your choice. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with each verse by scrolling to the bottom of each Bible study video. If you are in need of prayer, you can visit our website and fill out the prayer request form. Please be sure to indicate if you would like your name added to our online prayer list page. And most importantly, please indicate if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We also ask that you visit the prayer list and pray for our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Last but not least, the United Body of Christ app is available in the Google Play Store and your iPhone app store. Let us now join Pastor Clarence for today's Bible study lesson. Well, God bless you, saints, citizens, and soldiers of the Most High God. My name is Clarence, and I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, which is an online ministry. On behalf of my family and myself, we'd like to take this opportunity to welcome back your families, to welcome back yourself to another broadcast, another Bible study. Uh, today we are coming at you with Proverbs chapter 18. Uh, actually looking forward to getting into it, especially when we get towards the end of the chapter. There's some uh, good uh, topical discussions uh, I can see uh, uh, at least towards the, the end of that chapter there. So really looking forward to that. As always, before we, go, before we get started in our Bible study, we like to go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father, thou art in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom comes, thine will be done upon this earth as your will is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins. We ask that you would forgive us of our transgressions. We ask that you would forgive us of our trespasses. Lord God, we ask that you would forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who are our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the hands of the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. It's in Jesus' name in which we pray. Father, we come before thee this day, having bowed down heads and having humbled hearts, eager and excited about being in the presence of God, waiting and willing to take in the words of God that our spirits may be edified, that wisdom, may, wisdom and instruction may be bestowed upon us. We're even excited about being the children of God, made possible because of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that shepherd and bishop of our souls, that Lamb of God who is the Lion of Judah, the intercessor of men who resides in heaven and reigns and rule from heaven even upon this earth. Jesus, we take this opportunity to say thank you for allowing us and making us to be children of the most high God. Jesus, we thank you for being our intercessor, our high priest there in heaven. We say thank you for the, the truth and liberty that is within you and the power that's found in the name of God. Jesus, thank you for sending us your Father's Spirit and allowing us to have access to the kingdom of God. Jesus, thank you. Father, we take this opportunity today to draw close to you, to learn of you, to, to have access to wisdom, 
to retain the precepts, to retain understanding and knowledge that we can go about this world and the world to come doing those things which please you. We give thanks to you for looking in on our, our goings in and our goings out, Father. The way we come in and the way we go out, how you've taken care of us. You've kept us safe from hurt, harm, or danger. You provided, you nurtured. You even given us a resting place. And Father, we've done, we, we can't say, we can't testify that we've done everything to please you. There are some things, Father, that we've done probably, Lord, that, that you were not well happy with us. But your grace and your mercies all the day long, we found that they're tender sweet. And I thank you, Father. I thank you in the name of Jesus for how you are towards us. God, I even thank you for creating us. For you are that sovereign king of the universe. Thank you for your provisions towards us. Even gathering us at this hour, at this time, even through this broadcast, that we may take in the word of God, that we may take in your truth, and that we may learn that we may learn how to prosper, how to get along one with another, how to love one another, how to endure until the end, how to fix that which is broken about us, and how to overcome that we may come over. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the Spirit of God that dwells inside of us. I thank you even for the angels that gather around us and minister unto us the will of God. So, Father, have your way in this Bible study. All the things that you've done to lead us up to this point and this time within our lives, we ask that you would just have your way in this lesson so that we find ourselves edified and nourished that we are, find ourselves having received instructions about things that have come our way or things that which is to try us, God. Have your way in this Bible study with us collectively and individually. Equip us, position us, transform us on the inside out and have your way, God. Have your way with us. I thank you for this opportunity to break bread with you, to break bread with my brother in God. I thank you. Always taking care of us, always there. You are the source of our joy. You are the source of our strength. You are the almighty God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. You are the Hebrew God who is our Father. So, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for being abundantly good. Thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayers and answering them. Thank you for even giving us a desire to want to draw close to you, a desire to want to learn the Word of God, a desire to be better than that which we've been. God, I thank you. You are so good and so merciful and so kind. And you are true. You're the only wise, true God. Have your way continuously. Thank you for blessing us to prosper, to be in our right minds, to have peace and strength and health. You've given us testimonies time and time again. So we say thank you. We look forward to seeing you and meeting you face to face. Yet until that time, we will continue to draw near. Thank you for this word which we are about to receive, for we receive it in Jesus' name. And we say amen. <clears throat> Again, we are coming at you, uh, Proverbs chapter 18, Proverbs chapter 18. Uh, as always, God is the chef, 
the bread that God has prepared for us to break and receive. It's the bread of life. It's that word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that has moved your family and yourselves, my family and myself, that we can come together in this broadcast, that we could sup, commune, and fellowship. Um, my wife and myself, we're the servers God has called us to serve that which he has prepared for all of us to receive. That's our way of giving God glory. It's our way of glorifying the Holy Spirit, and it's our way of glorifying the only begotten child of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, anything that you receive from this lesson, any understanding that you, you receive, it's because God, it's because you showed up and God wanted you to receive what you showed up for. So it was because of him why you have that which you received. Amen. So uh, to God be the glory. And as we begin, we know that man may not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. And before I forget, I take this opportunity to honor my wife, my best friend, the other half of me. <laughs> Amen. That good half. Amen. Uh, I bless God for her long suffering. I bless God for her tenderness, her compassion, her love, her nurturing. I thank God for allowing me to take his daughter by the hand for now these 18 years. And uh, my best friend, again, my best friend and my love. So to God be the glory for allowing me to have such a, 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 such a, a wife and uh, such a daughter of his. Uh, anyway, we'll begin. This is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. This, this chapter starts off being a heavy hitter. I'll reread this verse and then we'll talk about its, its meaning and its context. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. And let me kind of just break down uh, as an example of, of, of what the scripture is saying here. Say, women, say you've had your eye, <coughs> excuse me, on a particular man. You've had your eye on a particular guy. And this person doesn't seem to have the best of reputations. Amen. <laughs> He don't, there's a whole, his, his reputation precedes him and not for the good. And nevertheless, you've had your eye on him for a while and you would like to get a chance to know him and maybe uh, develop a relationship between him and you. Okay. Well, because his reputation uh, is, is not the best. Uh, people look down on him, and everybody has negative things to say about him. But you're not going to uh, allow that to change your mind because you have a desire to be with him. Well, because you know that even your friends have something negative to say about this person, well, guess what begins to happen? Because they're, they're not persuading you or convincing you to turn away from this person that you're interested in, you've committed to getting to know that person. That's your desire. Well, the problem is because everybody has something to say about it, you drop out of fellowship with people. You drop out of contact with them so that you can get a chance to know this person. And your actions are going against uh, the wisdom that's coming towards you concerning your uh, desires to be with that person. <clears throat> so that's what the scripture is saying. It's saying that a person will have such a desire uh, for, for whatever it is that they have desires for that they will drop out of contact, they'll drop out of fellowship with people and isolate themselves because they don't want to hear what others have to say. Even if others have good wisdom to, you know, that, that's, 
goes against what your desires are, you don't want to have to hear that. So you'll drop out of contact, you'll drop out of fellowship with them and isolate yourself in your own desires. Uh, uh, and, and that's what the scripture is saying. So through desire, a man having separated or a man isolating himself, he seeketh and inter intermeddleth with all wisdoms. He turns his back on all wisdom. He drops, as a matter of fact, he drops out of contact or he isolate himself so that he don't have to be bothered with the wisdom that that goes against uh, the desires that he has for whatever it is he has desires for. So that's what the scripture is saying there. And then I, again, I give you an example of maybe a woman that likes, again, a woman that likes a particular individual who doesn't have the best of reputations and, and all of her friends have something negative to say about that, that person. However, you don't see the worst in this person. You actually see the best Why everybody is talking the worst about them. So because they haven't changed your mind or your actions, you actually isolate yourself so that you can get a chance to know him without that interference. And, and, and that's what that is. That he represents your desires and you don't take calls you won't fellowship you won't socialize because you don't want to hear what they got to say about what you're doing with that particular individual so that's kind of a, an example of what the scripture is saying amen verse 2 a fool hath no delight in understanding but that his heart may discover itself um so you ever hear with the term that they just like to hear themselves talk? <laughs> a fool has no delight. People will talk so much because they don't want to hear what other people got to say, especially it says a person that's a fool or a person that don't have a lot of wisdom. Their, their opinion is the ones that matter. They don't want to hear what other people have to say. It's their opinion is the ones that matter. Amen. So they ex they have an expression of their own opinion, and a lot of times they keep it. They keep the mouth moving because they don't want you to to. They don't want to give you the floor to speak that will contradict what's coming out of their mouth. It's they don't make room for their own opinion to be challenged, and that's what that's what it's saying. A fool has no delight in understanding but that his heart may discover itself. It's all about his opinion, and it's that person's opinion that matters and nobody else's. Amen? So that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's, that's what that's about. And they'll, they don't want to receive, uh, a fool has no delight in understanding. They don't want to receive it from nobody. So they'll keep talking. They'll, they'll keep doing what they're doing because they don't want to receive understanding because at the end of the day, it's their opinion that matters. Amen? When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and, and then uh, with ignominy uh, reproach. So I'll, I'll give you another translation of it. Doing wrong leads to disgrace and scandalous behaviors that bring contempt. And that's what that's saying there. So when you're doing wrong, it, it, it brings about uh, uh, disgrace or shame. Um, and then that leads to, to contempt is what the scripture is saying. So when the wicked cometh, then cometh also. So in their actions, their actions lead to shame. And then from that shame, they end up getting, uh, uh, dis, you know, they're, they're looked at as being disgraceful and, and rebellious or a person that's always in contempt. Okay. Verse four, the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters. And the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. So when a wise person speak, it's as soothing as deep waters. And it flows as, as a flowing brook. That's how wisdom is. When a person, is, uh, when a person that, uh, that is of wisdom, when they begin to speak and you actually listening, it's like they're getting it from a reservoir. You know, like like the wisdom, and then it, and then when they able to, when they articulate the wisdom that comes, it's like it's flowing like a like a flowing brook. It's smooth like a flowing brook. That's how the scripture puts it. Amen. It's not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment, and this is showing partiality to where uh, you'll. 
find, you'll be more, you'll show favoritism towards those that are not doing right. And, and you'll band together with them to get rid of those that are doing right or those that are trying to be upright. You'll show partiality against them and begin to favor those that are not upright, those that are not righteous. You end up joining with them and then y'all band together against those that are being upright. And that's what the scripture is saying. It's not good to accept the person of wickedness to show partiality against the righteous by banning with those that are wicked and you're doing it to overthrow righteous in judgment amen a fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calleth for strokes this is a heavy verse what the verse you ever you ever been in high school or when i was growing up in the 80s and in the 90s you know, a person that was always talking smack, that was the word that we used back in the day was smack. Person that was talking smack, boy, you know, you wanted to light them up because they was always talking crazy. That was, that's, that's, that's what it was. Up. That's what, and that's kind of what the scripture saying. A fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth call it for stroke. And, you know, you'd be like, keep talking, keep, 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 keep talking, keep talking. Right. And before you know it, you were in a fight with that person, that person constantly talking smack and you couldn't shake it off, especially if they was talking smack to you when you was growing up. You couldn't shake it off before you know it, you were into a fight because they were asking for it. And that's kind of the slang way of what the scripture is saying. A person that's constantly running off at the mouth is asking for it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the modern way of looking at the scripture. A, a fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calleth for strokes. He, he's, he's just asking for it. He keeps running off at the mouth and he's asking for it. And that's, that's what the scripture is saying there. Verse 7, a fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of of his soul. So verse six and verse seven goes hand in hand. You know, his mouth will be the ruin of him because he can't get his mouth under under check, you know, under control. Verse eight, the words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Now, I, I want to kind of give you the actual translation because the word that you see there wounds it's really the that word is saying tasty morsels is what that word is specifying and if you understand that the word there is tasty morsels because if you look up the hebrew translation for it it's it's really specifying a, a, a treat, a dainty treat or a tasty morsel. So if you got that understanding of what that word wounds is, then you kind of understand the, the, the context of the scripture. So the words of a talebearer, a person that's always in somebody's business, that's tattletelling, they're always, uh, they're gossipers. That word talebearer is a gossiper. So the words of a gossiper are as tasty morsels and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. So in essence, a person that's always gossiping, they're doing it to the satisfying of their, uh, uh, of their bellies. So think about this scripture in this context. Think about the scripture in this context. Imagine going out to a restaurant that you love and then you order and you order until you are content, you're full, you're satisfied, man. And, and you look forward to going to that restaurant so that you can eat. That's kind, so that you can eat that favorite dish that they specialize in. And then it fills you up. Well, it's saying that that satisfaction that that person get at the, at the, from being fed at that restaurant is the same satisfaction a person get when they're gossiping. It satisfies them to, to, to the point that they're full, okay? It, to the point that, and, and it's, it's metaphorically speaking about the fool, it's talking about the delight that they get, you know, in being in somebody else's business. So that word wounds is tasty morsels, and, it's, and that bit of information 
that bit of gossiping is going down up in you and setting into the satisfying of your belly. And that's what the scripture is saying. And it, it, it's, a, it's an emotional thing for a person when they're, tell better, when they're, when they're gossiping because it, 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 it satisfies them emotionally as though it's like it's a, some sweet bread going down into their gut. That's, that's the comparison that the scripture is making here. Amen? He, verse 9, he also that is slothful in work is brother to him that is a great waster. That word waster, if you look up the translation, it's a destroyer. And you kind of got to think about it to this extent. Uh, a person that is lazy is akin to a person that, that, that wastes stuff. That, because, they, because they waste stuff. Uh, uh, it they end up destroying the stuff. Um, maybe you have food because you don't like to cook, but you know you need to buy groceries, and your milk is spoiled because you you didn't even get to it before the date because you just don't like. You know you can see how the scripture says a person that's lazy and a person that waste is on the same plane because. The milk is no longer any good. You destroyed it by not drinking it, by not consuming it. Why didn't you consume it? Because you were too lazy to fix yourself a bowl of cereal or to make some pancakes or to utilize the milk to keep it from going bad for whatever reason you would have utilized it for. So again, the scripture is saying that a person that that is lazy and a person that wastes things, they're cut from the same cloth. <laughs> Amen. So that's that's pretty uh pretty heavy to look at there. Verse 10. I love, I mean, absolutely love this verse. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it, and it's safe. So we find refuge in the name of the Lord. You have to have a relationship with him for that to mean something to you. Do you, do you understand? You because it's about you know where to go when trouble hits. See, a lot of people because they they'll hit rock bottom, then they want to go after they tried everything else and everything has let them down. Then they want to go seek the face of the Lord. But the righteous, those that have a relationship with the Most High, we know where to go when the wind seems. Oh, there's a storm on the horizon. I see the wind blowing a little hard. It must be bringing in a storm. Before trouble comes, we know where to go. We have, we, we're used to utilizing the name of the Lord. We always seek him for his protection and for his safety. We know where protection is. Amen. And that's just how it is. You got to be able to walk with God for this scripture to make sense with you, to make to make sense to you. See, we don't run in and out. That's not how this thing is. You know, when you have a relationship with God, you start to understand I'm not perfect, but I'm going to work on those things that are imperfect about me through Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus, it, he allows us to have access to, to, to the Father and, and to the throne room. Amen. To, he allows us to become children of the Most High God. And we quite often visit our parents' house. <laughs> Amen. We utilize his name to get access to his palace, to his home. Amen. And we, 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 we're not ones that only visit once a year or when things get bad. We quite, quite regularly frequent his residency. Amen. And that's just how it is. But we want we're not content being this way. We want others. We don't want to have it all for ourselves. We want others to understand that when you begin to walk with God, when problems come your way, when things rise up against you, you're quick to go into that closet. Even before things rise up against you, sometimes you just want to wake up and tell God, thank you. Because he let you wake up. And, and as you're telling him, thank you, you begin to reminisce about all the things that he's done for you. And, and you begin to just praise him. That's utilizing his name. That's going into his place. It's making sure that your name is still on the road to have access to him, right? That's just how it is. 
That's our relationship with him. And this scripture here is specifying the relationship that you have with God so much so that you know that you have access to him whenever you need it. That's what it represents. Amen. And we want you to have that. We're not content in having it for ourselves. We want somebody else to be able to feel what we felt, to have what we have, to experience what we've experienced, to have access to what we've had access to. Amen. Going on with this, the rich man's wealth is his strong city and as high wall and as a high wall in his own conceit. A man, when trouble comes, he begins to hide. Um, even before trouble, he builds up uh, a bank because of his wealth. He will build up a, 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 a high wall or a strong wall, if you will. And, and think that he can't be touched by the affirmities of this world or think that he can't be touched by the conflicts of this world. Uh, and, and so much so that he's conceited in, in, in his observations. It's a false sense of security. His, he measure his security, the strength of his security is measured by the vastness of his wealth. And he thinks as long as he has his wealth, he is secure. And that's what that scripture is saying. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and as a high wall in his own conceit. Uh, but because he's he's delusional to think that that his money, his money will keep him from some problems, but it's not going to protect him when the bottom falls out. Amen. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty and before honor is humility. That's a powerful verse, too, because it's saying pride comes before the fall. Before destruction, before the fall, the heart of a man is prideful. So pride comes before the fall. But in the opposite of that, before there comes honor, there comes humility first. So when you're humble, when you're constantly humble, you'll end up having uh, honor. And when you're prideful, you'll end up having destruction. So those are the two parallels there. He that, and I'm constantly, I was telling my wife as we were going over this lesson, I'm constantly trying to better myself because this scripture showed me where there is a problem. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. And I'm guilty of this right here. A lot of times my wife will, will speak or she'll tell me something and I'll just jump to try to finish the sentence. Or because I know the answer to a question that she may, she probably didn't ask, but I'll jump as though that I knew where she was going with it. It's not good, you know. And sometimes I look foolish because she may not have been going there with it, but I jumped ahead. It's better to, to shut up and hear someone out. Even if you know the answer, let them finish asking the question. Even if you know the subject, let them at least frame it, if you will. And then, you know, begin to elaborate. And so I know I, this tells me that I got to do a better job at allowing things to play itself out before I participate in the discussion of it. Amen? Verse 14. Um, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded man, who can bear this is a real powerful verse here. It's saying that when someone is sick, in time, their spirit will begin to heal the body. Amen? That's how that is. If, if a person is sick, then in time, the spirit begins to heal the body. But the second part of this verse, but a wounded spirit who can bear... When you are, in, when you're not sick, but you're emotionally crushed, who can, who can bear that? The spirit is, is, that's not an easy fix to have a crushed spirit. And that's what the scripture is saying. It's, it's easier to fix a sick body than a crushed spirit. That's, that's what the scripture is saying there. Amen? So when somebody is broken hearted, that's, that's not an easy fix for the spirit as it is if there was somebody that was sick with the flu or what have you. The heart of the prudent giveth knowledge and the ear of the wise 
seeketh knowledge. So that's self-explanatory. <clears throat> verse 16 is a, is a real heavy, heavy verse here. And I'm a living witness to this. A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Before great men. Um, I was ordained years ago. And my pastor at the time, uh, I was first ordained an evangelist. And then after that, I was ordained, uh, it's not too long after that, a year or a year or so after that, I was ordained as a pastor, ordained and installed as a pastor. And um, my pastor at the time, the one that did the ordination service for me, services for me, he would always say, he would always quote this verse concerning me, a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Not too long ago, um, my, uh, my, uh, we had a, a, a death in the family. And um, my family and I, we're, we're okay. This, th there's a scripture that Jesus was saying that um, a man is without honor in his own nation or in his own country, if you will. That's kind of the same when it comes to your family members. Um, that you're not going to be <coughs> as close as you would as you would want them, especially if you live differently than than what your family lives. And uh, you you may have family members that that are still they're not ready to commit to walking with the Lord yet, but you have. And so you may have those members that that they're not going, those members of your family, it's going to be hard for them to relate to you because they remember how you were. And it's and and because they're not walking in a sense that you walk, they're not there yet. I believe they will be, but they're not there yet. So they don't look at you. This current version of yourself. It's not easy for them to, to accept or to digest. So that causes separation between your family and you at times, right? Um, but one day recent, my family actually called on me and was adamant about me performing uh, the funeral services. Amen. And it was a big, it was a milestone for me. And now let me tell you something. It's not something that I wanted to do, to be honest with you. I'm kind of the person that I fall to the back. I'm not the kind of person that, that's to the front of things, you know, volunteering for this and for that. Do choose me. I'll do that. I'll, that's me. I got it. That's me. I'll, I'll, that's, that's, I'm not like that. I'm trying to stay in the background of things, right, to, to not be... Uh, you know, to let somebody else have it. That's me. But my family was adamant that I would be the one to to do uh, the funeral services, to even to speak at the, the service as well. And it kind of references this verse here because I didn't, my, as my wife was, her and I was talking about this, the, the, um, the funeral director, I never even met them at the time, but the day of the services, they, they came uh, and they knew who I was and where I was and came and, and, and introduced themselves and, and brought me to the front and, and uh, let me know uh, how the order of things and, 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 and what have you. And when you're faithful to the Lord, this is the summary of this, when you're faithful to God, one of the things that we try to do is be here every every Sunday to to make a, a a broadcast, and I don't like to give fruit off the ground. Meaning, I don't just like to go through the scripture and don't I don't like to go into a broadcast not being prepared. I like to study to show thyself approved, and regardless of my condition, I do try to be here every Sunday. Um, 
I want to be faithful to the Lord and I want to make sure his children eat, you know, and, and God honored that. And regardless of what my family would have thought about me, it didn't matter when this situation happened that there was a death within our family. I was the one that they called on and, and asked if I could, if I would be willing to do, do the services and, and, uh, and the Lord really gave me a powerful word to preach at the service. But it brought me before other pastors that wanted to know where we hold service at. Because they wanted to come and attend. They were so moved by the message that God had given me to speak. Um, they were very, very moved. And... Um, so it makes me think about this. So that's my testimony. It makes me think about this. And my pastor had always said this to me, that a man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. And again, by the time we were done with that service, with the message and all, these other pastors that were there, the, um, one of them happens to be the funeral director, but he was also a pastor as well. He wanted to know, where, 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 where do you speak at? Where are you speaking at? Where's your services at? Because my wife and I, we, we like to come. And, you know, so it, it really was an honor. And so my point is, hang in there with God. People may not notice you right now, or you think they may not notice you. But I tell you, stop trying to be noticed. Put more focus into serving God. And be content with that. And before you know it, God begins to exalt you. He begins to place you around other people. Be faithful to him. Say those things that are difficult to say. Declare those things that may not be popular, but will bring God some glory. Be truthful in, in who you are and what you speak. Be truthful. You're going to ruffle some feathers, but you're not trying to offend anyone. You're just doing what you were hired to do, what God chose you to do. And if you be who you are, people, how many times people been in a place of worship and they, they, they'll get an attitude because they wasn't called on. They, they wasn't asked to do this or to do that, you know. And so they get an attitude. I was there. I was that kind of person. I remember when I was living in South Bend, this was some years ago, this was before my wife and I had been married, this is before I even knew her. Living in South Bend, Indiana, I was going to a place of worship. And the Lord has always given me a, a, a gift of writing to where I was always able to write. And my mom is the same. She has a powerful, I would say her gift was actually more powerful than mine as far as writing. And um, when I was working on my, I was submitting myself to God through the place of worship so that God can begin to work on me. And part of this uh, uh, submitting of myself to the place of worship, I wanted to, uh, uh, I wanted to, to be able to recite poetry because I saw praise dancers and various things and the, the things that I was able to write as far as poetry goes, I wanted to do that. You know, I wanted to be able to, to go before people and, and to recite the poetry and, uh, <laughs> I was only able to do it one time, and they never called on me again, so I found myself having an attitude, right? I mean, kept an attitude for a while about it. Eventually, I ended up moving, but I didn't move because of that. I didn't, you know, I, I moved out of state. I didn't move because of that, but I, I had, but I carried my attitude with me when I did move, and now, when I look in my life now, looking back at that situation, I was too busy trying to be noticed. I wanted everybody to look at me and to hear what I had to say. And I was, you know, doing everything I can so that people can see me. 
but the one that you're trying to get to see you is the Lord and he sees everybody and he sees everything so you don't have to try too hard and when God is done working with you he'll place you before people because he's breaking some stuff off so I can't say when he's done working with you when he be, when you begin to submit yourself to him on a consistent level on a consistent basis eventually you're not worried about everybody else seeing you or what they think about you all you're worried about is making sure you please God and it's that time that God will start placing you before the very when you stop looking to come before people that's when God will start placing you before people <laughs> that's, that's how that works but all while you're trying to get noticed and you're trying this and you it, it, he don't your, your gift is not making you're stagnating your gift but when you begin to do those things as unto the Lord and you begin to just focus on serving him and doing what he tells you to do you get consistent with that that gift that God has you that has that he has placed in you now God will start to bring use that gift to bring you before other people because he knows that when you get in front of those people you're not going to make it about you you're going to make it about him so <laughs> that's that's what the gift he's the one that gave you the gift so that you can use it to glorify him see before i would have been trying to get noticed to glorify myself but now as i started walking with him and it's to me it's about the lord i walk with him so it's about him it's about how i can please him that gift now if god placed me before men I'm trying to put it right back to him. That's, that's when it is. That's how that thing works. So your gift makes room for you and places you before great men. But that happens when you're willing to use that gift to glorify God and not to make yourself known before men. That's how that thing works there. So that's a, that's a real powerful thing there, that the way that God has it, you know, the way that it works. Amen. And again, my pastor used to say that to me, and and uh, <clears throat> there therein is 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 the truth in that. Uh, verse seventeen: He that first, he that is first in his own cause, seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. Let this is. <laughs> This is a heavy hitter right here. You know what this scripture is saying here? I'll reread it and then I'll tell you what it's saying. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. What it's saying is there are two sides to every story. So when you are first to put your side out there, <laughs> You, you, you're wanting everybody to hear what you got to say first and you hoping that they make their minds up based on what you got to say. However, you have yet to be cross-examined and that's the other side. That's when the scripture is talking about the neighbors come and search at them or the neighbor come and cross-examine him or simply put somebody else will bring another side of the story. And therein is, therein is the truth in the matter. So, again, what the scripture is saying, he that is first in his own, in his own call seem as just. He that puts his, his own story out there, it, it, he's hoping that because he's first, he will be the one to seem right. Amen. And, and, that, and hopes that there is no other side of the story. And this is kind of what we see today. When we're dealing with the shots that, that, that you know, the country and, and those that are in power would have you to take, when you have questions about the effectancy, effect, efficiency of it, the, how effective it is, um, they, only, they only want to give you the kind of data to support uh, what they're asking you to do. Um, they don't want the other side of the story out there. 
And so they want to be the on, they want to be the only version of the story, um, so that you don't question and that it makes you seem right and it elevates their case. And for a, a great number of people, it it is the case that it, it, it you know it helps them. But when you get more specific in your questions about those, it may not have helped greatly. Um, you it's hard to find answers on that right there. Amen. So that's kind of an example of that. You want your narrative of the story out there and not someone else's narrative out there. And, and if you only get one narrative to that, you don't have the whole story. And that's what the scripture is saying. It's, it takes two sides of it. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. They're bringing the other side of the story, and you want to have both sides so that you can make an informed decision. When you're in court, it's not only the, 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 uh, the defendant that gets a chance to defend themselves, but it's the prosecutors, it's, it's the litigants, the people that come together, and they both tell you their sides of the story, and so those that are listening can make an informed decision on which on how to decide who's right in that regard you got to have both sides of the story if someone come and tell you something about me or if someone come and tell you something about somebody else you got to have both sides of the story if they come and tell you everything that's all good you should be questioning well what's the problem if it's all like this then why is this like that it's if somebody come and tell you something that's all bad then you should see, is there something good to say about it? There has to be two sides of the story. And that's really the main focus on the context of the scripture, having two sides to the story. And the person that's only putting out the one side, it's incomplete. I don't care how good it sounds. If there's just one side of it that's out, it's incomplete. Amen? And that's the problem there. Verse 18. Um, the lot causes contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. So it's, it's, it's casting, casting lots, the coin flip. Imagine how many, if, if, if you could come to an agreement through a coin, no matter how severe the, the problem is, imagine that. <laughs> That's, a, that's what they do when, when a football game goes into overtime and you see these two, uh, I think you got 11 players on each, on each side of the field, and they're both competing to get that, that title or to get that victory for that particular game. And, and if it, the game carries over uh, beyond uh, uh, the time allotted and it goes into overtime, then the person that flipped the, you have to call heads or tails on the coin to see which advantage you're going to have. And, and, if, and the person that chooses the, that, that right call on that coin suppose, is able to decide what advantage they want to, uh, they, op, you know, they have an opportunity to, to obtain. So in this regard, and I, that may not have been a real clear example, but in this regard, it's saying that as simple as a coin flip, it's able to cause problems to, to cease. And then it says it parts between the mighty. It gives understanding between the, the, the two parties that are in contention. That simple coin flip. Amen. And that's the casting lots. Verse 19, and this is another heavy hitter. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. When you offend somebody and you constantly do it, it gets to the point that they'll say enough is enough. And you'll come as many times as you've been able to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my bad, my bad, my bad. Eventually, your words will no longer c carry any weight. You won't be able to pacify them. Because once that unforgiveness sets up in them, and that's what you're dealing with, they get offended so many times 
you know, because you've done did them wrong so many times that that's it. They've drawn the line and they say enough is enough. And nothing you can do is going to change the course of, of where in the direction of where that's headed. It's not nothing you can do. You can come and say, I'm sorry. You can do everything to, to, to you know, to show, give fruits of repentance, but they will not receive it because they're, they're offended. And what sets up is anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness. That begins to set up inside of them. And, and you'll have a better chance at, at snatching bars out of a window than being able to get into to where they are because they won't even let you near them. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have a better chance at pulling bars out of a window than being able to get close to them for them to hear how bad you feel or how sorry you are about this particular situation. Once they're offended, and it's a once and for all, it's a wrap. And, it's, and you really have to wait. This is how, when you see things, um, people, when, when you're at a funeral, family, um, they don't, you know, it, 20 years later, people may have forgotten what caused the separation, the division, the, the anger and the animosity, all they know is that they can't stand you and they don't want to have nothing to do with you, but they can't remember how we got to that point. And 20 years later, even at a, at a funeral, they still have these bars set up that, that were put up because of the contention or because of the problem. The bars are still up. And you don't have access to them. You can't come and say sorry. They don't want to hear anything from you because they're fed up with you. And, 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 and they, you can't win them over. And that's what the scripture is saying. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. So that city that set up its defenses, you'll have a better chance at, in, at successfully invading and conquering that city then you'll have that getting close to the person whom you offended and telling them you're sorry. And they'll set bars up. That, that, that problem or those problems that they have with you causes bars to go up that are unbreachable. You can't get to them. And that's because they, they set up bitterness, anger, animosity, uh, unforgiveness. All that has been set up, and that's what support the beams that have been put up against you. Amen? A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Uh, so that's self-explanatory. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and then the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Verse 21, another heavy hitter. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. So... Imagine, um, imagine having, um, I don't know, adults in your life um, that you can't do no good. That if you're not always given a hundred percent, then you'll never do good, and then they'll they'll. They'll tell you, you will never be nothing. The mother may say to the son, you're going to be just like your dad. He was good for nothing, and you'll be good for nothing. The, 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 the dad may say to the daughter, you're going to be like your mom. She was loose out there, and you're going to be, you're just like her. You're loose. You know, just um, bringing that child down. Um, well, what they're doing is they're plotting the path uh, of life that that child is going to take, right? They're plotting that path. And when you constantly go negative on somebody, you're destroying any optimism that, that may set up. Now, it's okay to be truthful with people, but your words still need to be seasoned with grace. But when people just literally try to tear you down, they're, 
what they're doing is building themselves up by tearing by tearing you down. And that's no good because they're dictating, they're, they're at least attempting to hijack the path that God has set for you to take. And they're doing this by trying to tear you down. You know, they're, they're sowing seeds inside of you. So you have to be careful in what you say to your children. You can't tell them you're good for nothing. You're stupid. You'll always be stupid. You can't tell them these things because you're hijacking the path that God has prepared for them to travel on. And you're creating a menace to society when you do that because it becomes generational. They grow up thinking that there will never be anything and then they'll live according to the standard that you set for them in their childhood, that you verbally set for them in their childhood, right? They'll grow up to that and then they'll begin to pass that on to their children. They're destroying, it becomes a generational thing all because someone did it to that parent, that parent passed it on to their children and then they pass it over to their children and so on and so forth. You have to be speaking life. You have to speak life in people's lives. You have to speak life. You don't want to constantly speak death in somebody's life because that's what it is. You're robbing their future. And so people love to wield it. They love to have that much control. You know, we, we listen to our leaders uh, and they don't bring us together. They help keep a division. They'll tell you the, it's, 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 and I put it out there, they'll say the pandemic of the unvaccinated. You know, there's th things that spread division. Um, as, you know, it don't matter which administration, people have a way of wielding words that, you know, that, that, that causes divide and, div you know, division and contention. Um, you have to be careful. If you're a leader, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, uh, if you come before the public, you have to choose your words with grace because you don't want to try to continue to sow division and discord and hijack the path that God has assigned for someone, to, someone else to take. Amen. And, and so sometimes people just don't know any better because that's the way they were brought up. And so they'll speak divisive things against you because, and, and let me tell you something, when you see there are different trees out there, um, a pear tree, an apple tree, there are different animals out there a lion, a tiger, a bull, a giraffe. There are, there are different, um, there's differences out there. The point that I'm trying to make is people are different. No two, pers no two persons are the same. No two people are the same. People are different. That means because you have difference, because you're different, you may have a difference of opinion. But because you have a difference of opinion, there shouldn't be a point of contention because you don't necessarily agree with the view of the other person. An apple tastes quite different from a banana, but they're still good, in my opinion at least. Grapes and strawberries taste different, but they're still good. I love them both. I love them both. And we have to be that kind of people that we're willing to hear what someone got to say. And even if we don't agree with their views, we shouldn't spread discord concerning them. It shouldn't be the case. And here politically, 
You know, if Republicans against Democrats, Democrats against Republicans, so much so that the nation becomes split. And, and, and you're seeing hate rather than love. And it's because we, you're seeing people can't make you do what they want you to do. They, they're not hijacking the path that you are, you are already set to travel on because they can't get you to travel on the path that they're trying to set before you. Uh, there be a point of contention and they speak negative against you. And then in ult ultimately you speak negative against them and that shouldn't be the case. So we have to be mindful about what we say, how we say it, who we say it to. Amen? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We should be encouraging people. And if, if, if they have views that are controversial to us, that's fine. But we shouldn't be trying to change them. Just as, just as well as we hope that they respect our decisions, you want to respect their decisions as well. You shouldn't be trying to change them to try to make them more like you. You respect who they are and just be like, well, it is what it is. But death and life are in the power of the tongue. We should be encouraging, edifying, you know. Um, and they that love it, those that they'll use it to control you, uh, will eat the fruit of it. Whoso findeth, I love this verse here. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. I'm here to tell you that just because you got a girlfriend don't mean you got a wife. <laughs> let me, let me, let me just, let me tell you, okay? You may have plans on marrying the woman that you're with, but she may not be wife material. <laughs> you may have plans on marrying the dude that's currently with you, but he may not be a, a husband material. That's just the bottom line. And that's where people go wrong because they're trying to turn somebody in to what they want them to be. And you can't do that. You're, you're, you're trying to see who they are and to see if that's compatible with your own desires. Not trying to change them, but trying to see if it's that person... Some women are brought up to be homemakers, to be beautiful wives. And when you find that kind of person that has those characteristics inside of her, she's that kind. It is, it's you, you end up getting favor because you've done the right. You made a family with her and the Lord begins to honor that. Amen. You end up getting uh, uh, nowadays, it's, people don't want to get married. They, 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 they rather have it easy to where they live together, but never put a ring on a finger. And, and they've devalued the, uh, uh, the foundation of marriage because they want to have, they want to be able to get out of it as easy as, as, as a, a, a lease expiring after a year to be able to part ways. And that's no good. You know, um, God would have had you to become one with that person. So the problem is she's got to be a wife. And if you find the woman that has the, those characteristics, then she'll do you well. But if you find somebody that's just, <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say. She's good to hang out with, you know, take her to dinner, but she's not, she's, she's, She's not a wife. She's, you know, that's a little different. Amen. Now, I wanted to kind of elaborate here on some more of, of having things in, in this proper context. I want to turn your attention to Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. And you'll get a chance to kind of see where I'm headed with this uh, based on a reading here of Genesis chapter 24. Here's what this says here. Genesis chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Abraham was old and he was well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said unto his eldest servant, 
the eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, he told his elder servant, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou should not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanite amongst whom I dwell. So Abraham was in the land of Canaan, and he was dying, and he wanted, he wanted the, the governor of his house, of his estate, was a servant. And he wanted his servant to find a wife that was not of the place in which they stayed. They stayed in the land of Canaan, and, and the women, <laughs> those were... The women there, they, they were not, um, how can we say it, they were not evenly yoked uh, with, with, you know, with the Hebrews. And he, he tells the servant, I want you to go back to my homeland and get one of the daughters of my homeland and bring her to this land of Canaan for her to be. But I don't want you to take my son back there because God, God brought us out of that place. So I don't want you to take my son there to try to go back to the place in which God brought us from. But I want you to just go back there to get a wife to join him where he is now. And I don't want a wife from here because these aren't wife material <laughs> women that are around here. Don't get them none of these Canaanite women because they're not. I, <laughs> no, no, they're not. Go back to my homeland and get one of those. Okay. So that's the backdrop. That's what's going on here. Um, verse, uh, verse 3, And I will make you, so he said, I'll make you swear by the God of heaven and the God of the earth that thou should not take a wife unto my sons of the, of the daughters of Canaan among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again to the land from whence thou camest? So the servant said unto him, what if the woman that you have me to go get, what if she's not willing to come and leave her land to come to this land of Canaan? Should I take your son Isaac back to, to thy kindreds, you know, to that land? Abraham said unto him, beware that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of the heaven, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which spake unto me and that swear unto me, saying unto thy seed, I will give this land. He shall send his angels before thee and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. So Abraham was was um, steadfast in not wanting to to have his family go back to the land in which he was delivered from. He was like, no, God, God delivered me from there and placed me here. He planted me in the land of Canaan. Uh, he says, I have enough faith in God that God will be able to bring a daughter or a wife, I, I would say, from the land of, of, of my kindred and bring them here. And if, and if the woman uh, will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. So if the woman you choose don't want to come, then you don't have to keep trying to find a wife for my son. You're clear of this promise or this oath. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and he swore unto him concerning the matter. The servant took ten camels of the camels of his master, and he departed. For all of the, all of the goods of his masters were in his hands, and he arose, and he went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down outside of the city, without is outside of the city, by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord, so the servant began to inquire of the Lord concerning the wife concerning a woman for his master's son. So he brought God into his request and his desire. That's where a lot of people go wrong. You don't bring God into it. See, you bring God into it and you let God facilitate some things, God will make some things happen. 
People don't want to bring God into it. And when you get with that person and you discover that she wasn't a wife or he wasn't husband material, well, then it's too late. You know, the damage has already been done. So the first thing we see is the servant bring God into this. So it says uh, the servant took 10 camels. Verse 11, he made his camel to kneel by the city. Verse 12, he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, the woman to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thee thy, and she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let that same be that that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness unto my master. So the one, so God, the woman, so this is what the servant prayed to God for. The woman that's mindful to not only give me water, but she also is willing to take care of, of, of the livestock, the camels. Not only is she concerned about my well-being, but she's, she'll also be concerned about the well-being of the livestock. Let that be the woman, and he's talking about the character of this woman to be the wife of his servant's son. And that's the thing. It's the character that makes her the wife. Do you understand? She's generous, she's kind, and she's considerate. Do you understand? It's the character that makes her the wife. So just because you found somebody, you know, that, it don't mean that you found a wife. It just she's she just because you found old boy don't mean you found your husband, especially when you didn't put God in the mix. Amen. But I digress. OK, verse 15. So it came to pass before he had done speak before he was done speaking that behold, Rebecca came out who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor. It happens to be Abraham's brother, with, who happens to be Abraham's brother. So basically, Abraham's niece came out. Abraham's brother was Nahor, and this is Nahor's daughter that came out. So Abraham's brother, with, with her picture upon her shoulder. The damsel was very beautiful. She was very fair to look upon, and she was a virgin, so she hadn't been with anybody else. Neither had, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink. Drink, my lord. So she called him my lord, meaning that she was very kind, very considered. She, uh, she was considerate of this person, very kind. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him to drink. And when she was done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they've done drinking. And she hasted it and emptied her pitcher into the, tr into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all of the camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And so again, in that you'll see that God had, God had, God was asked to facilitate um, the choosing of of the woman that would be a right woman or my or a, a meat for Isaac. Amen. And so that's what that comes down to. So again, when the scripture says, "He that findeth the wife findeth the good thing." You got to be careful, be, and then obtain the favor of the Lord. Not every person that you find is going to be that wife. He that findeth the wife. Not everybody that you find is going to be a wife because they they haven't been brought up to be that way. They don't have those kind of qualities. And now that's not to say that they can't be that way. You just haven't caught them in that time of your finding of them. 
you you haven't you haven't found them yet to where those qualities do reside that means that they still being worked on or they haven't submitted themselves for repair yet if you will they, they they're not there yet it's not to say that they won't be there they're just not there yet and so when you try to make a wife out of a person that's not a wife yet there's a that becomes a conflict of interest it's the same if you try to make a husband out of a person that's not ready to walk in those shoes yet they're becoming conflict of interest and it's not to say that they can't transform into that what you're looking for it's just not it's just not time yet so understand that he that findeth the wife findeth the good thing but when you do find it and then y'all become compatible when you marry and she becomes your wife and you're her husband god honors your marriage by giving you favor he does those things he he opens doors that y'all can walk through together see the world will try to open doors that will leave the husband out and just allow the wife to choose their ways and not her not to be with her husband and so you got to secretly bring him along for a ride it's not like that with God the God honors the foundation that's been established between you and him he brings y'all together and he gives you favor for that he'll allow you to obtain things because God honors your your union he honors uh, your family amen of going to the end of this verse 23 the poor uses entreaties but the rich answereth roughly so the the poor is always asking for mercies but the rich is not always willing to give mercy they're they're merciless whereas the the, the poor is asking you to be merciful okay a man that has friends must show himself friendly and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And what the scripture is saying is really interesting when you look at the translation of the scripture. What the scripture is actually saying is when you have a lot of friends, you're on the cusp of finding ruin. You know, but when you can when you can pick, pick when you can point out that one person, there is going to be out of all the friends you got, there is going to be that one person that you will find that's more than that's more of a brother than a friend. A lot of people or a lot of friends will bring you into ruin, ruin. But there is that one person out of the multitude of friends that you got will show themselves to be close like a brother. And think of this in terms of social media. Everybody that follows you or that you follow is not your friend. But there is going to be a person that's going to be there in good times and in bad that that's transcend all of those people that are following you. Too many friends can bring you into great ruins, but there should be that one person that's going to be close to you. And that's actually what that scripture is saying. Amen. So. That's going to uh, conclude our lesson for today. Eternal God, I thank you for this word. I thank you for the opportunity to declare your truths. God, I even thank you for the examples that you set before us. I pray that the examples uh, would help us to have received this word in simplicity. And Father, because my tongue was being used, I pray that my tongue did not disparage to I pray that it didn't discourage anyone that's been trying to understand uh, what the scriptures were saying. I pray that everything was kept within its context. I thank you for the opportunity to declare your truths. I thank you even for the, the people that you've allowed to hear it. I pray that they receive it, that they would receive instruction with it, that they would even draw close to God because of this word in which they receive. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that we would glorify you through obedience and through holiness and through your truths. And I pray that we would receive freedom and liberty because of the truth in which we just received. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'll quickly go through, uh, 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 just for, for time's sake here, I'll go through quickly. Uh, what the scriptures is saying concerning uh, our salvation.
uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, this is called the Great Invitation. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus is speaking to the people and he sees, he, he, he sees them individually and collectively. And he tells them, I know that you've been burdened down. I know that, that you've been, been carrying the weight of the world upon your shoulders. And this world has let you down and they wore you out. I'm here to take those burdens off of you. And so I invite you to come and, and allow me to do what I do on your behalf. So that's surmising what Jesus was actually saying to the people. And here's actually what he says. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, meaning that you're burdened down. And I will give rest unto you, or I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. You've gone to the world and learned the system of the world to try to make it work for you. And you found that the systems of this world has been working against you. He says, now come and learn of me and see how I'll be working on your behalf and not against you. And that's what he's saying. Take my yoke upon you. Commit to me is what he's saying when he says, take my yoke upon you. Commit to me and learn of me. And you'll find, that's what he's saying here, you'll find that I'm meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest for your souls. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, Jesus is saying, what do you have to lose? Come to me. This world has robbed you of all kinds of stuff. They've robbed you of rest. They robbed you of peace. He says, come to me and let me restore what the world has taken from you. Let me give those things back. But you got to be willing to do it my way. And then before you come to Jesus, you have to be willing to turn away from the world because you can't have one foot into the kingdom of heaven and the other foot into the kingdoms of this world. You have to commit. That's what taking your yoke, that's what taking this yoke is. You can't have half the yoke on your neck while, you know, half of it is on. Why, but it's not connected. It's just on your neck, but you haven't connected it. Remember, that's that commitment to him. You know, you, you, you're not ready. You, you're entertaining it by placing the yoke on your neck, but you won't connect it, you know, because you, 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 you're not ready yet. If you're coming to him, you have to be willing to give all of you to all of him so that he can undo what the world has done to you. So that means, remember we said you can't have one foot in the kingdom of, of, of the kingdom of heaven while you got the other foot in the world. You can't do that. That means you have to totally uh, uh, repent of your participation of, of, of the sins that you've committed in this world. You have to, com you have to repent of that because you can't just come to him being being half in and half out. Once you decide to let him go to work on your behalf, then you're choosing him to be Lord over you. You're choosing for him to, you're choosing him to, to obey. You're saying, I'm going to obey him. I'm going to live my life according to his standards now. It's no longer about me. It's now about him. And in order for it to be about Jesus, it can no longer be about you. So therefore, you have to turn away from the world because the world, draw, they drew you in by making it about you. But it was really about them. And they wore you out. Now you got to make it about Jesus. And in doing so, you make him Lord of your life, meaning that you're choosing to obey him. That means you're turning away from the world and turning to God through Jesus Christ. So that means you have to repent. And then once you repent, you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he can save you. We'll find that in Romans chapter 10, beginning at verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What are you being saved from? The answer is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 36. And it tells us what we're being saved from. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. You got that eternal life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You're being saved from the wrath of God. That's what you're being saved from. God's wrath is going to fall on you for, for rejecting Jesus and rejecting God. And you will find yourself being condemned. And even in the lake of fire, Jesus is going to save you from all that. But in order for him to save you, you have to make him Lord. And that's what the scripture is saying, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, you're making Jesus Lord of your life. And then you have faith to believe that he came into this world to save all of mankind so that they wouldn't die in their sins. Jesus became a lamb of God. But it's up to us if we want the sacrifices of the lamb or we just want to continue in our sinful ways. That choice is up to us. But God made the way through Jesus Christ for us to be saved. Amen. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So God says, you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth. For, whoso, for the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So if you, the scripture is saying that if you take a chance on God and you hang in there with him, he won't let you down but you you got to hang in there with them amen for there is no difference between the jew and the greek there is no difference between hebrews or gentiles for the same lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him so the same salvation that god is offering the jews god is also offering us who are not jews and it says that what we have to do God is going to do his part by offering us salvation. Our part is to receive it by calling on the name of Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So instantly you know that you have to do your part and call upon the name of the Lord so that he can save you from your sins and the wrath of God won't fall upon you. If you will also go with me to 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. 1 John chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. And look at what this says. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's good news. Let me tell you why that's good news. Because we're able to come to God as we are. We're broken and we're fallible. We don't have to pretend to be somebody else. God acknowledges that because we've been without him, we've been broken. He wants you to be honest about what's broken about you. And a lot of us don't want to do that because we're ashamed of what we've been and who we've been doing it with and what we've been doing. Amen. We're ashamed of that. But if you want to be forgiven and delivered from those very things that you're ashamed of, you have to be willing to confess it. You don't go to the doctor feeling real bad and the doctor asks you why you're there and you say, well, I need you to figure it out. I'm not going to tell you why I'm here. No, you want to be treated for the ailment which brought you to the doctor's office. Well, it's the same with God. If you want to be forgiven for the sin and you want to be delivered from the power of it, then you need to let God know what it is you've been doing and, and what it is that you repented of so that he can deliver you from it. So again, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, meaning that you let God know what it was that you've been doing and what it is that you've turned away from, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So, if, if we repent and confess, God forgives and cleanse. Again, if you repent, turn away from your sin, and you confess what the sin was, then God will forgive you of the sin and cleanse you from the unrighteousness of the sin. Amen? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Well, if we're not honest about what it is that we've been up to, then God can't do anything to save us because we, we won't allow him. Amen? Lastly, go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. This is after the Spirit or the Holy Ghost fell upon the disciples on this one particular day of Pentecost. After the Spirit of God fell upon the disciples, not only did it fall on them, but it came inside of them. The other people that were there on this holy day of Pentecost, uh, they were observing the holy day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost used the, 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 the tongue of Peter to minister the gospel uh, to those that were there, those other worshipers that were there that day. So again, uh, the Spirit of God fell upon the disciples, the, tw the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God fell upon them and then used... Um, Use their use Peter's tongue to minister the gospel. Now, this is after uh, Judas uh, uh, was was taken out of the mix. He was no longer with them. Amen. So now, after having been filled with the Spirit, Peter begins to speak to those that were there. And here's what Peter says, beginning at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God had made that same Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. So what Peter is saying to those that were present, he's saying that your lifestyle make you just as guilty as those that have crucified Jesus on the cross. So the, so the Roman soldiers that nailed him in his hands and nailed his feet to the cross and the people that turned Jesus over to the Roman soldiers for them to do that to him, your lifestyle make you just as complicit as they are. So basically your sins are no better than their sins. And God is going to group everybody together, you know, because uh, unless you repent of your sins and come under Jesus Christ as Lord, those that have not accepted Jesus as Lord, God is going to group you together with other sinners and judge you accordingly. So that's what Peter is saying to them. Uh, so G he said, Jesus is not only the one from God, meaning the Christ, but he is the one who is over us. He is the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. He is Lord. He is the one whom we have to obey. Now, when they heard this, they were convicted or they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So when the audience heard the truth, when they heard the powerful message, that powerful gospel that Peter was preaching, whom the Holy Ghost was giving him to what to speak, they, it, it moved them to where they wanted to go to repentance. They wanted to know what could they do to right the wrong. They wanted to know what they don't want to keep living their lives in shambles. They wanted to take action so that they can get their houses in order. So they asked Peter and they asked the other disciples, what can we do to make things right between God and ourselves? Peter answered it this way in verse 38. He said, repent. That's turning away from your sins once and for all. That's what we have to do. When you want to make things right between God and yourself, you have to turn away from your sins once and for all. Then Peter says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now let's talk a little bit about baptism. Jesus died on the cross. He laid down his life on the cross. Jesus was taken down from the, from the cross and he was laid to rest in the tomb. He was laid to rest for three days and three nights in the tomb, meaning he was dead for three days and three nights. After three days and three nights, he was brought back to life. He was resurrected. So he was laid to rest in the tomb and he was brought back to life. 
Okay, now when you go through the ceremony of baptism, when you are laid down into the water being fully submerged, you are being baptized in Jesus Christ. When you come up out of the water, you are being resurrected in Jesus Christ. Your old man goes down into the water, your new man comes up out of the water. Remember we read in, in, in uh, um, 1 John chapter 1, in verse, I believe it was in verse 9 where it says, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Baptism represents part of the cleansing process. So you go down into the water. When you come up out of the water, you're cleansed, you're made whole, uh, and you've been, you're, you're forgiven. You're forgiven before you go down in the water. You're cleansed of the stain of that sin when you come up out of the water. All your sins are washed away. Amen. So you want to get the ceremony of baptism done. And I know we live in a, a, a during a pandemic, uh, people are saying we're on the cusp of an endemic. But we live during a time to where most of our livelihoods or most of our actions are dictated by uh, the, the virus. Amen. And so much so that we turn our back. We don't gather like we should. We turn our backs one on another because people, a lot of people live in fear. And it's better for us to live by faith and be obedient unto God. So if God put it on you to baptize someone, then you have to show up to do it. Same way for those that are, are, are new into the kingdom of God and you want to go through the ceremony of baptism, Ask God to send someone to you or to send you to someone to have the ceremony uh, uh, performed on you. You don't necessarily have to be in a place of worship to have the ceremony performed. As long as you can find a body of water that you could be fully submerged in. We've baptized people in swimming pools. We've baptized people in whirlpools. We've baptized people in bathtubs. Amen. Just as long as you have a body of water that you can be fully submerged in, it's better to be obedient unto the Lord our God. So make sure you get that done. Amen. And the the virus is not going to be an excuse that you can that you can say to God as to why you why you didn't get it done. So you want to get it done. Peter goes on to say, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Just as the disciples received the Spirit of God, we all receive, receive the Spirit of God. Peter says, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. So as we said before, God don't have grandchildren. He don't have great-grandchildren. As God promised you and given you the opportunity to accept the gift of eternal life, the promise is also unto your children and to your children's children. If they would receive the gift of eternal life, that promise is, is on to them as well. With many words, uh, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this godless or lawless generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers. So whatever God has done as he's worked through you uh, because you've yielded and submitted yourself to the authority of Jesus Christ and God began to perfect you through Jesus Christ, whatever he's done to get you to this point in your life uh, where things are moving according to the plan of God, and you're starting to have joy in your life, you're stronger, you're better, don't take your foot off the gas. Whatever you've done, whatever God has done through you to get you to this point, it takes that much and then some to keep moving forward. So if you've been praying, if you've been fasting, fellowshipping, whatever you've been doing, studying the word of God, whatever you've done, to get to that, you have to keep moving forward with that. The moment you begin to stop, the moment you begin to stop observing those things, 
your prayer life begins to suffer, you're not fellowshipping, you're not walking with God, you're not reading his word, you begin to dry out. You begin to fizzle out. Before you know it, you start slowing down. Eventually, you become, you, you stop altogether. And once you stop, you will eventually go back to what you used to do. You begin to backslide. To keep from backsliding, always keep moving forward in those very things that got you to where you are now. Amen? Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their meat or their food. They ate it with gladness and singleness of heart. They were praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God, I thank you for the word, the gift of salvation. Even the platform to declare your truth. I thank you above all and moreover for the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through him whereby the gift of salvation is offered unto man. It is through him in which we are called to be partakers of the gift. So, Father, thank you for long suffering with us. And thank you for calling us out of darkness into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for all that have answered the call. I pray that they will even receive the Spirit of God, even without measure. I pray, Father, that you would join them with other brethren in houses of worship whereby we can become true worshipers of God, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. I even pray, Father, as thou would hear me, that they find a place to be baptized, that you would lead them or lead someone to them that can perform the ceremony of baptism. Father, you are able to do all that we ask for. And I thank you for always working on our behalf. Father, help us to continue to glorify you. Help us to continue to endure until the end. Increase continuously the size of our family by adding to the church daily such as should be saved. Our petition is before thee, and it's in the name of Jesus in which we pray. Amen. Folks, I thank you for allowing my family and I to be a part of your Bible study. Um, you've been with us for a long time. Some of you have been with us for a long time, and I thank you. Our benediction comes from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. Please repent of any and all sins. I want you to be blessed. Amen. I want you to receive these blessings. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. I loose this on you. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee. And give thee peace. I loose this on you as the hearer and the doer of God's word. That you would prosper. And that you would bless the Lord our God who has caused you to prosper that you would remember him. I pray that you would be fruitful in all that God has called you to do for the sake of his glory. Receive it with thanksgiving. Receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. I loose it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you and God bless you. Thank you.